Okay, everyone, um, it's time to start. Welcome to the CCEM's webinar series. This webinar, we will be uh, looking at the focused eye on BEAM, introduction and applications, and the presentation will be given by Travis Casagrande, who runs one of our FIBs at the center. Um, just before we get started, I'd like to know if you have any questions throughout the session, can you please post them in the chat? And I will be moderating the chat and making a list of the questions um, for Travis to ask, answer at the end. If we don't have time to answer all of the questions, uh, we'll be posting a separate video later where he addresses the additional questions uh, that we couldn't get through. This video, um, this presentation, sorry, is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel in a couple of weeks and I'll send out an email to let everyone know when it's available. Um, so that's all my announcements. If you have any questions or having any technical difficulties that I could help with, uh, please feel free just to chat with me um, in the little chat session there. All right, I'll pass it over to Travis. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, as Sam mentioned, I'm Travis Casagrande, and I've been here at the CCM for seven and a half years. The majority of that time has been spent doing focused ion beam. So, I'm going to be sharing some of that knowledge with you. Okay, so this is going to be a two part presentation, starting with introductions and theory that I think is useful to know as a FIB operator to help make better decisions. The second part is about the most common applications of FIB and a few others too, and I'll explain what they are, how to actually do it with some examples, some tips here and there. And I'm trying to be brand neutral throughout this presentation, so this can apply to any FIB operator, regardless of what type that you have. So I think there's something here for everyone, whether you're completely new to FIB or you are a regular FIB user. In case you missed our webinar last week about SEM by Chris Butcher, here's a very quick explanation about image formation. It's relevant here as well. So an SEM, it's a beam of electrons, is accelerated towards a sample of material and focused with magnetic lenses down to a small spot for a set dwell time. This interaction with the sample produces secondary electrons that are collected by a detector and the amount collected is assigned to a gray level from black through to white to form one pixel of an image. The beam is then moved over one increment and the process repeats many times forming a line and then with subsequent lines to form a 2D grayscale image. Instead of an electron beam, we can do this exact same thing with the ion beam. So secondary electrons will be induced by the ion beam interaction with the material and they can be collected to form an image. Here's how an ion beam works, specifically the kind used most often in FIB, which is gallium. So gallium metal is heated to liquid and wets the tip of a tungsten needle, where a strong electric field pulls the liquid gallium into a very sharp cone tip. The tip of the liquid cone acts as a field emitter, so gallium ions are ionized and project forward in a beam, where they're accelerated to typically 30 kV and focused by electrostatic lenses. And uh, there is good reason why gallium is typically the ion source of choice for FIB. It has a low melting point, only about 30 degrees roughly. Minimal reaction or diffusion between the gallium liquid and the tungsten needle of the, um, uh, the tip there. It has low volatility, um, so it keeps its source reservoir from evaporating, so it's, uh, it's well preserved. And um, the emission char characteristics provide small energy spread, I think because most, nearly all of the ions come off as um, one plus. So like electrons, when gallium interacts with the specimen, they also cause secondary electron emissions and actually a lot more than electrons do. But ions do something very different that electrons can't do. I use an analogy here. Let's say I've glued baseballs to a wall, lots of baseballs, in a close packed arrangement, like atoms in a metal crystal. Uh, the glue here, this is strong yet flexible glue, but
but they're certainly not bolted permanently in place. I'll color each layer. Okay, now what will happen if I throw a baseball at the wall? And that's me. One throw probably causes many balls to break out. The damage would extend well beyond the diameter of one ball. You can see in my drawing there, also a few layers deep. The impact produces sort of a shock wave that goes even farther and than the size of the crater. And this can disrupt the perfect arrangement of the balls, maybe even dislodge a few balls internally. This is what an ion impacts does to a surface at the atomic scale, and this is called sputtering, all, all the ejection of the baseballs here. So the ion beam can accelerate, can be accelerated to different voltage, voltages, and um, what does that look like? I have a decent throw, but let's call that a medium voltage. High voltage is a major league fastball throw. Damage goes deeper, more balls are broken out of the wall per throw. What about low voltage then? A small and inaccurate impact, only a few balls break out, a few layers are affected. It's pretty gentle. Okay, so that's voltage. What about current? More babies. That would be low voltage, high current. So you know what's coming next, right? This is high voltage, high current. And uh, you can see how quickly and devastatingly the, the wall is destroyed. This is basically analogous to high current, high voltage in FIB. So why don't electrons cause sputtering though? Electrons are fast, very fast. Um, so if we scale, talk about uh, size to maybe explain this. So if we scale a gallium ion up to a baseball, then how big is an electron? Is it a grain of sand? No. Blood cell? Virus? No, even smaller. It's only about the size of a buckyball, which is about two nanometers. So, so um, yeah, it's a little bit smaller. So anyway, the answer is momentum. I did some calculations, and at 30 kV, even though an electron and ion have the same kinetic energy, the gallium ion has 342 times higher momentum, and because of its size, it doesn't penetrate as deep into the material as an electron, so the impulse is absorbed by far, a far smaller volume of atoms. For an electron to have the same momentum as a, a 30 kV gallium ion, it would need to have an acceleration voltage of 61 mega electron volts, which is really approaching the speed of light. That's 0.99 C. Just as an example, this TEM, the biggest one I could find, is three mega electron volts. So basically, you put 20 of those in series, <laughs> then you can get a gallium ion worth of momentum from an electron. There's a human for scale. Okay, so I'm going to be talking for a while about the properties of the ion beam. Let's first talk about what happens to the beam diameter with respect to voltage. So 30 kV has become the standard voltage for FIB operation, but FIBs also have a few low voltage settings. At lower voltage, the sputtering yield is lower because there's less momentum. The resolution is horrible, though, because the chromatic aberrations are high. You can see the effects of the probe diameter. So in practice, low voltage is mostly used just as a finishing step, which I'll describe later in the application section. OK, so if low voltage is bad, why don't we go higher than 30 kV? Well, the damage effects get worse, like amorphization, ion implantation, that, that gets deeper. That's probably not a good trade-off, especially considering that the sputtering yield also plateaus and then drops as voltage rises. Now what happens versus current? As with SEM, when you raise the current, you are also effectively lowering the resolution, partly because of a larger aperture, but also higher spherical aberrations. Unlike with the SEM, the ion beam diameter changes much more dramatically. 
you can see in the graph that the diameter increases exponentially at high currents. Um, you can't really even see the low current range though, so here's a zoom in on that. And you can see the increase is much slower at the low current range. This is with gallium. Other Fib sources though can and do behave differently, uh, xenon for example. The effects also go beyond just the simple trade-off between milling rate and image resolution. Higher current also increases the amount of redeposition, which I'll explain later. The distance beyond the edges of milling shapes, also we'll explain later, that, sputtered, um, that gets sputtered and damaged. The angle of the milled surface isn't as parallel to the beam, and the resulting milled surface isn't as smooth. So typically, Everything improves when you, you use a lower current, except for the time it takes you to mill. So you can think of this as a general trade-off between quality and your time, as a general practice to maximize both speed and quality. You start off with a, an aggressive current and finish with a gentle one, usually with a few steps in between. When an ion impacts a surface, the chaos that is caused is called the collision cascade. Many atoms in the material just are displaced and bounced and bounced around hitting their neighbors. The size of the cascade volume extends well beyond the ion beam diameter, which is why when you mill a spot or a line into a material, it's going to be nowhere near as small as the, the quoted beam diameter that you actually have. The, um, Incident ions either come to rest somewhere within the material, which is called implantation, or they get ejected back out of the material, which is called back sputtering, which is analogous to a backscattered electron in SEM. Secondary ions from the material are blasted out into the vacuum, which is sputtering, as I mentioned before. This only occurs from atoms near the surface, and they come up from impact by both the incident ion and from the atoms in the cascade of collisions. Also, many secondary electrons are emitted per incident ion, and it's much more than you get with an SEM, but 10 times more. Uh, and they're also only produced, well, they're produced everywhere. Only the ones near the surface will escape. And um, the electrons come from both the primary impact site and from the collision cascade. So they could be coming from a little bit beyond where the beam struck as well. The ion beam penetration depth is highly dependent on the material. The, the stopping power of the material being highly correlated with melting temperature and density rather than directly with atomic number. Here's some examples of ion trajectory Monte Carlo simulations that I did with software. This is 30 kV gallium ions coming from the left into various materials and showing a range of, of about 15 to 50 nanometer penetration depth. As FIB operators, we can't control the material, but we can control the incident angle. Next slide, hold on. Uh, before incident angle. Okay, here's an example uh, with nickel. It's a nice mid range stopping power material at 30 kV. The ions go as deep as about 23 nanometers. At 10 kV, you can see this drops to 10 nanometers. At 5, it's about 8. And at 1 kV, the depth drops down to only 3 nanometers. Now let's talk a bit about angle. So a convention in FIB is to measure the ion beam angle to the surface normal. So as the angle becomes more glancing, that's increasing it towards 90 degrees, the penetration depth decreases and the sputtering yield increases. So you can see why the sputtering yield increases on the left, that graphic. When milling at an edge, many more secondary ions will be able to escape. Uh, because now the the collision cascade sort of interaction volume is exposed to that edge surface.
These bottom three simulations show 30 kV at different incident angles. Um, here the beam comes upward at a glancing angle. In that case, the ions don't go as deep laterally. So we drop from that 23 at zero degrees to 12 nanometers at 83 degrees and only eight nanometers at 89 degrees. These simulations here show the beam at 83 degrees into nickel with different voltages. Um, at 30 kV, the ions go about 12, uh, as we saw before. But then at 10 kV and this steep angle, or glancing angle, um, that drops to 6 nanometers. At 5 kV, it's 4. 1 kV, it's just 2 nanometers in. I'll show you a little later how this is a very important finishing step for TEM. So this combination of both low voltage and the glancing angle by doing that, the penetration depth is quite minimal. And uh, this works, as you can see from the graph on the right, within um, sort of the 80 to 90 degree angle is approximately the same at um, the three voltages there. So now some damage artifacts from FIB. First here, ion implantation. This is a consequence of high energy ion beams, ion beams interacting. Um, some of the ions are implanted and remain in the material if they don't get back sputtered out, like that one there. The maximum depth is the same as the penetration depth that I just talked about. Sorry, I'll go back here. Uh, during milling, steady state of ion implantation is reached because as more ions implant, the material continuously disappears due to sputtering. The amount of implantation is material dependent though, and it's inversely proportional to the sputtering yield, which means that materials that mill slowly require a higher dose for sputtering and therefore end up with a higher concentration of implanted ions inside. So in spectroscopy, you would see a higher concentration of gallium, uh, foreign gallium from the FIB in something slow milling like steel compared to something fast milling like copper. Another uh, artifact of FIB, ion beam interaction in general anyway, is uh, amorphization. So for a brief moment of the ion to solid interaction, crystalline material in the interaction volume is so heavily disrupted that it's basically like a liquid, just for a brief, brief moment. So materials with simple unit cells and bonding like metals tend to resettle back into their natural crystallographic arrangements quite well. However, more intricate unit cells are less likely to be able to recrystallize. And this is especially true if the bonding is covalent, as in silicon, germanium, diamond, other semiconductors like gallium arsenide. So this sort of amorphous state is basically metastable. It's not thermodynamically stable, but we don't have all day, all year, all heat. <laughs> So it's going to remain amorphous. So for materials like those, the amorphous layer will be thick, and the thickness can be reduced by shrinking the penetration depth that I mentioned a few slides ago. Sputter yield, this is um, how fast we are removing ions from the material. So this is heavily material dependent. As a FIB operator, this is your relative milling rate of the material, and with different materials, you can more than double your FIB working time. The yield, sputtering yield, is governed, governed by the surface binding energy, which you can approximate by the heat of sublimation, and this will be strongly correlated with bond strength, too. Or, for something more familiar, you can consider sputter rate to be inversely proportional to the melting point. So you can see in the plot here, it's not proportional to atomic number, but it does follow general periodic trends. Redeposition. Uh, 
Uh, sputtered material and backsputtered ions can deposit on nearby surfaces. So the amount is related to the kinetic energy of sputtered particles, their sticking coefficient, and the sputtering yield. In this example image, the boxes were milled into silicon and the dose was doubled twice um, as it moves to the right. You can see the roughness on the sidewalls increase. I'll highlight what you should be seeing next here. It's the sloping of the sidewalls causing a narrowing of the resulting base. So milling at high aspect ratios, trying to create a deep but narrow trench, doesn't work very well and it's physically limited. When the redeposition rate equals the sputter rate, the net result is no further progress of the mill. The sputtered material has nowhere to go, so it just deposits nearby and you end up milling the same atoms again and again. It's pretty futile. At the bottom, I have sim a simplified 2D version of what happens when you try to mill deep but narrow. So you get this sort of classic V shape. We can manage this effect by using a lower beam current or widening the milling geometry so the atoms have more room to escape, the sputtered atoms. Using a trapezoid shape is helpful instead of a box that gives more room for the uh, redeposition and also escape. And for surfaces in the XZ plane, you can also over tilt the stage a little. Redeposition contaminates the surfaces, and for most applications of FIB, you need to minimize redeposition. Otherwise, your samples may be useless. So this is a very important thing to be aware of here. Okay, an interesting effect with FIB is uh, called ion channeling. So when the ion beam is aligned with the crystallographic direction, the ions penetrate deeper than in an off-axis direction or an amorphous material. The amount of extra depth depends on the density along the plane. So you can see here that if you were looking, uh, if you were an ion, imagine you're an ion, looking at this FCC lattice, you're not getting very far in the dense 111 Miller index direction, but there's some empty space in the 100. And you can see the 110 is wide open, so an ion could go quite deep in that direction. Ion-induced secondary electron emission, the production of electrons, is a surface event. So the crystallographic orientations that allow the ion beam to go deeper also yield fewer secondary electrons. So that grain where the ions go deep will appear darker, perhaps a 110 grain. Sputtering yield is also affected because sputtering is a, um, is a surface event. So deeper channeling means less sputtering, even at the zero degree incident angle. Um, that's the, um, sorry, yeah. yeah, the image is there. The orientation can also affect edge quality with off-axis milling, sometimes resulting in more sloped sidewalls and a rougher trench bottom. Part of the reason, though, is just because the milling rate is higher if there's no channeling. So the milling goes deeper and has more redeposited material, which is that effect that we just saw causes the, the walls to be more sloped. Okay, milling shapes, we're starting to get somewhere into doing useful things with the FIB. So milling a shape is the simplest thing a FIB does. The amount of freedom you have in creating different shapes and adjusting the parameters strongly depends on the particular FIB and software that you're using now. Again, I'm not going to be brand or model specific here, um, but it's common for every FIB to mill lines, rectangles, trapezoids, circles, rings, text, and binary graphics. That's the easy stuff. Some software gives you the freedom to create your own shapes, maybe even merge or subtract shapes, clone them into arrays, even to add gray levels where the color, the grayscale color in the image becomes a third dimension to indicate relative ion dose at each pixel. 
This ranges from simple gradients to complex 3D profiles and even just grayscale JPEG images or TIFFs probably. There are um, not actually many parameters to control in a FIB. Sorry, there, there are actually many parameters to control in a FIB and the options depend on the software that you're using. But it's not just a simple rectangle. There are, there are too many FIB parameters for me to even go through, but I'll describe the most important ones here. So probe current is usually the most important decision because this is a direct trade-off between quality and your time. The direction of the scan establishes, establishes which edge is the start and the finish. You want the finish to be the side of the shape that you care about the most because that will be the cleanest and the deepest surface. Um, you need to set when to stop milling or stop condition. This could be the milling time for the shape or an estimation of the depth that will be achieved, which is highly material dependent, or even the approximate total number of ions will be delivered to the shape, which is called the dose. Actually, I think dose is, is uh, more in terms of current per area, but basically the, the amount of ions that are being delivered. Unfortunately, each of these stop conditions is a judgment call still, where you just need some practice to be able to get the results that you are expecting. It just takes time. A lot of uh, FIB is really just experience-based decisions. The number of passes through a shape also greatly affects the results. This is sort of how many times the, um, the ion beam scans through the shape. For most of the applications, you want the finish to be the deepest and cleanest. So in that case, one pass will do it and also mill efficiently because most of the milling is in that high angle regime. However, if you're starting a deep shape, might be a good compromise to have two or three passes. Otherwise, you run into the problem of trying to mill too narrow and too deep at the start of the mill. It's fine towards the end, but you know, just starting it off might be good to go a couple times through the shape. For a flat bottom shape, use many passes through it, probably minimum five and likely more if you want it to be very even. But this comes at the cost of milling time efficiency because you're closer to the regime of milling at zero degrees, which is the least efficient because the sputtering yield is the lowest. Additional parameters exist for um, saying what to do in your rectangles, but the software typically manages them for you with an optimized automated selection. You may still be able to manually adjust some of them though. This includes the dwell time per pixel, the horizontal and vertical spacing of each pixel, whether to apply a dose gradient or 3D profile across the shape, and the specific raster pattern, for example, standard or serpentine or double serpentine, which is basically serpentine pattern. And then when you get to the bottom, you go backwards in the reverse direction, maybe even spirals. Um, you can see in that little example there, the effect of um, single pass versus multi-pass. So the, the cone in the single pass goes quite a lot deeper um, than both portions of the multi-pass. And in the multi-pass, it's more subjected to the, uh, the differential sputtering yields as a result of the crystallographic orientations there. It's very important to be aware that the sputtering will extend beyond the edges of your shape. If you're not aware of this, you can easily wreck your samples. The extent of this depends on the probe current and the perfection of their alignments too. At high currents, this extra damage can go for multiple microns beyond the edges of your shapes. You can see in my example, 45 nanoamps, which is my highest current available. There's some damage about two microns ahead of each box and uh, more at the starting outer edges of the shapes. For 13 nanoamp probe, it's less than one micron of damage if it's well aligned, like it is there, and it's kind of right after an alignment. 
And uh, this effect can worsen over time as the probes drift out of alignment. So, you know, they can get defocused or get astigmatism or the apertures drift or um, the um, beam shift to reach probe drifts and then it doesn't mill exactly where you tell it to. So you can destroy the area that you're trying to preserve if you're not very careful to keep your shapes a safe distance away from what you're trying to protect. If you don't know what to expect from any given probe, just test it first, spend the time so you know what you get. That's always better than having a disaster. Fib doesn't just mill, but with the right conditions, it can also grow a solid material deposit at site-specific locations. The deposited material, most commonly platinum, tungsten, or carbon. Some other metals are possible. SiO2 can be deposited as a insulator if needed. So here's how deposition works. FIV has a heated reservoir of an organometallic precursor that is typically powder at standard temperature and pressure, but becomes a gas with just a small amount of heating, like um, 60 to 80 degrees, roughly. There's also a tiny tube nozzle that can be moved into position very close to the specimen. And with the distance varying a little bit by brand, but it's, it's about 200 microns away from the surface. These components collectively are called the gas injection system, or GIS. When uh, the gas is injected through the nozzle to the target location, it adsorbs to the surface. Through the ion beam interactions with the surface, the adsorbed molecules decompose into volatile fragments that are carried off by the vacuum system, and a metallic deposit remains. For this to work well, the gas needs to have some specific properties. It needs to absorb easily, adsorb easily to surfaces. And um, it must also decompose far faster than it gets sputtered away. The um, ion beam doesn't care whether there's gas there or not. It just does its thing. There's, there's no difference. It's just, is gas there or not when you're setting it up, basically. some important parameters. The success of a deposit depends on the careful choice of ion beam parameters within a narrow range of tolerance. Here's an example at the top of what a failed deposit attempt looks like. That location took hours to find and seconds to be destroyed. So let's talk about deposition parameters. Current uh, a simplistic procedure might guide you to use just one beam current all the time, but in reality, it's more that there's an optimal current per area or flux that gives the best deposition. If the flux is too low, the deposit goes slow. Incomplete decomposition of the adsorbed gas can cause more impurities as well trapped within the deposit. If the flux is too high, the sputter rate will dominate over the deposition rate the result will be a hole, like that example, milled into the shape instead of a deposit grown. So there's a Goldilocks range, and it's quite a balancing act. You can get inefficient milling where a slightly high current mostly deposits, but then mills into, into a little bit because the gas is depleted while the beam is still in, in that location. And also the fastest deposition conditions tend to give you kind of a lumpier deposit than if the current is on the low side. And uh, the smoothness of the deposit influences the quality of the milled surface, which I'll explain later. So optimization is tricky. It's helpful to have a number from the manufacturer for the ideal flux that you can choose. Um, or well, you know your area, you choose the current based on that calculation of uh, using the flux, which is the current per area. If you don't have that kind of number, unfortunately, well, you can just make judgment calls based on experience. Maybe you have a typical set of parameters that um, works most of the time, but if you ever go significantly larger area or significantly smaller for your target deposit area, Maybe you can compensate by stepping up the current or down one step and see what happens. Test it again. Testing is always useful. So another um, 
important parameter for deposition is the pixel resolution, also known as spacing, also known as fill factor. These basically describe the same thing. It's a uh, spacing of the pixel in the deposit shape. If they're too close, subsequent pixels run out of gas quickly and then those ions meal instead. But if the spacing is too far apart, the deposit can have density variation or even voids in the spaces between the pixels, especially the sort of interstitial spaces. The optimum Goldilocks spacing, again, varies a little with uh, the different gas types and also the other FIB parameters. So my advice here is to test an array of conditions, figure out which works the best, or talk to someone who's already done that. That's always useful. That's what we FIB operators are for. That's not the right slide. Um, dwell time. This is how much time the ion beam sits at each pixel, typically a little less than a microsecond. The dwell time is too long. The adsorbed gas gets depleted and the ion beam begins to be, uh, the, ion be the ion beam, sorry, begins sputtering material away. And then on the other hand, if the dwell time is too short, the gas isn't fully consumed, so the deposition rate is slow. You get incomplete deposition of the adsorbed gas that can leave impurities within depo the deposit again, similar to the effect of having uh, too low of a current. You also need a stop condition for your, your box. So like with milling, this tells uh, the FIB when to stop doing that. It's either based on time, dose, or an estimation of the final deposit thickness. That's not a measurement. It's a hidden calculation based on an assumed deposition rate tend not to use that one. Okay, curtaining is another interesting effect of FIB. Can be um, tricky to deal with. And before the other uses of deposition, I, I really should talk about curtaining because it's, it's really um, plays a key role in what deposition is for. So this is an effect where sharp localized differences in the ion solid interaction result in vertical grooves being milled down the whole length of a cross section face. And it looks like a classic theater curtain. They're always red. Curtaining happens when there is roughness at the top edge of a cross section face at uh, the interface between heterogeneous materials and more so if their sputtering yields differ greatly and especially if the interface is vertically oriented then it kind of just stacks up porosity is bad too nothing mills faster than empty space right and the beam tail can dig grooves inward um, inward of the milling plane so you get kind of deep curtaining grooves when you have voids for uh, the scenario of what happens as a result of topography um, what happens is angled surfaces cause deflections of the ion beam. You can see in that little drawing there, the, the beam is sort of being distorted as a result of passing through the um, different angled surface. So what happens there is local variation in the current density and therefore different, different sputtering yields. So this effect can be mitigated by applying a protection layer. You can use lower beam current, that often helps. You can mill for longer time just to kind of push the curtains down. And uh, by correcting a poorly focused or misaligned probe, if, if the probe is um, out of focus or not in alignment, the, the beam tail is greater and that, that also kind of causes more of the beam to cut into the surface where it shouldn't. Okay, here are the most common uses of FIB deposition. I've mentioned this word a few times, the protection layer. Even low current FIB imaging causes some sputtering. So a deposit protects the surface from further damage and from imaging and nearby milling. The deposit also maintains the sample surface edge because edge rounding from the bean tail would only occur in the deposit as long as it's thick enough. The deposit also smooths a rough surface, which helps to improve the flatness of the milled cross section. That will greatly reduce the curtaining. So the protection layer is an essential step that's used in nearly every FIB application. 
Another major use, probably number two, is uh, for attaching. So a deposit can be used to join things together. Many people call this welding, um, but I don't because it's not welding at all. <laughs> There's no localized melting or and mixing of the two pieces. It's just a patch being deposited on top. So it's, it's more like duct tape. Anyway, this is essential for all FIP applications that extract pieces of material and place them somewhere that is more useful, such as in TEM and atom probe sample prep. In my example here, I want to join the needle to the top, uh, the needle to the block. So a deposit box would look like that. And when that's done, the resulting deposit looks like that. With deposition, you can also apply to um, electronics. So metallic deposits can be applied to function as wires that connect electronic structures. In my example image here on the left, I've connected two nanowires on an insulating surface with tungsten deposits. They're connected to nearby electrodes on the left and right so that a researcher can test their electrical contact. In uh, some fibs, SiO2 can be deposited and used as an electrical insulator, perhaps to support a deposited wire bridge over top of it or some other device component, or to just completely cover a component so that it can't be shorted. Okay, this is not exactly fib, but it's definitely a thing that FIB operators do. So when you have a gas injection system in an SEM, even the electron beam interaction with the adsorbed gas on the surface will produce a deposit. The deposition rate is much slower than FIB deposition though, but it has a very important function. Ion beam deposition actually starts off by damaging the, the surface. So remember the penetration depth of the 30 kV ion beam, that was about 50 nanometers, depends on the material. So all of the crystallographic damage effects accumulate until the ion beam deposit is thick enough to contain the entire collision cascade. In some situations, though, the researcher doesn't really care about the top 100 nanometers of their sample, and so then it's totally fine if it's a bit damaged. Just don't look there in HRTEM. You don't want to do that. But for anyone studying thin films or oxides, the surface is the sample. That's the most important part of the sample. So to protect that precious surface, FIB operator can apply first an electron beam deposit um, to build up, I would say, minimum 100 nanometers of protection layer before even peaking at the sample with the ion beam. Don't even turn it on because even FIB imaging at low current sputters material away. And if you have nanoscale oxides or coatings, that's a problem for your research. Also, the first few seconds of ion beam deposition can also cause some sputtering into the electron beam deposit. So don't be skimpy with this step if you care about your surfaces. Okay, so FIBs have a micro manipulator. So this is another tool. And uh, it's how we extract and move tiny objects within the FIB, such as uh, pieces of the specimen to be formed into samples for TEM and atom probe. The basic type is just a small tungsten needle, uh, like in my example image there, and they can be controlled from within the software using mouse and keyboard or externally with other peripheral controls. There are multiple speed steps. The position of the needle can be finely controlled in 3D space using these controls, and uh, the software in newer FIBs has made this much easier to do, but on older models, you'll find the, the coordinates are not orthogonal to the stage or the screen. So a bit of thinking is required to, to really move the thing properly when you're looking at the screen. Some manipulators have a rotation function, but the rotation axis tends to be the needle's axis and not the same axis or orientation as stage tilt. So that's tricky to work with. Some manipulators have different tips. For example, you can have micro tweezers that clamp onto things without requiring deposit. And um, with two needles, you can do microelectrical measurements. The needle, type, um, the needle tips, they're consumable because detaching requires the ion beam 
to cut it. So with every use of uh, the manipulator, a small amount of the needle is consumed. And here we have the coincidence point. This is, it's not a feature, but it's a concept. The electron and ion beams are typically either 52 or 54 degrees apart, but they're in the same XZ plane. So at some point they cross. This is called the coincidence point, and it's the only point in space where the SEM and FIB images see the same part of the sample. This is where you need to be almost the whole time you're working with a FIB because the gas nozzle and all the different FIB probes are aligned at this location. If the surface is in focus in both SEM and FIB, have, um, they both have the same features centered, then that working distance is called the coincidence height. The way to get there, the coincidence height is not really standard because the design of microscope stages is not standard across all brands. Some of them maintain the Z direction when the stage is tilted, but others will tilt the Z along with the tilt angle of the stage. Uh, the Y direction though, that typically moves with the stage in every case, I think. Um, but it's good to be aware of how your coordinate system is affected by stage tilts. Okay, this is, uh, this is the stopping point for the introduction in theory. And um, so applications will be another talk. But before I sign off here, I'm just going to play a little, little teaser of FIB applications. So this is a video. Hopefully it works with the uh, frame rate. Well, that was fun. All right, thanks, Travis. Um, so we have a bunch of questions that have come in, and if you have more questions, feel free to keep asking them in the chat, because um, we probably won't get through all the questions, but we'll address them in a separate recording that we'll post on our YouTube channel. So okay, first, I just wanted to mention some something to read here. So um, sure, sorry. Is this, uh, if you're looking for more in-depth information, really highly detailed, this is introduction to focused ion beam book, the, the pink book. Um, it's a bit old now, but uh, all the theory is still just as relevant as it is, as it was then. And um, there's another reference there too. Uh, it's a fairly detailed book chapter on focused ion beam. All right, so thanks for joining us. Okay, now it's question time. Okay, so first question, uh, would the composition of the deposit using E-beam deposition differ from that using ion beam and what about the conductivity? Uh, I think it's yes to both. So the composition differs, um, E-beam deposit, I think you get more carbon in there because you get a lot of um, carbon interactions with the electron beam. And then the ion beam deposit will have gallium, of course, which the E-beam won't. And um, both should have a little bit, well, will, not ideally, but will have a little bit um, 
of sort of not fully decomposed products from the precursor gases. So you might have some oxygen in there and that might even be a source of carbon, depends on the gas. Uh, so there's a difference there. Also, uh, so the, the other question is uh, connectivity. Um, with deposits, it's typically talked about resistivity and um, there is a difference even with just the ion beam deposit. Depending on the rate, you can get different resistivity of the deposit. And um, I'm, I'm sure there's also a difference between ion beam and E beam just because the composition is different. Okay, next. Okay. Um, how do you inspect the quality of the deposition? Are there any features that signal the best quality of deposition? Yeah, um, okay, so if it's, there's sort of macro scale features that you see as a FIB operator and then maybe more like nanoscale that you see in the TEM. So as a FIB operator, um, if it's lumpy, that's probably bad because you get curtaining effects from that. Um, if your deposition rate is really high, maybe you get shadowing from the deposit itself where, where the side of the deposit that's opposite the gas injection needle could be lower than the other side. And the, the higher you build up a deposit, the more that effect will be amplified. Um, and so that's kind of a macro scale effect. And maybe if the pixel spacing is too far apart, you'd be able to see that there could be variation in the density of the deposit too in sort of extreme cases. And then at nanoscale, um, again, if the density of the deposit is low, maybe you see voids in there. Um, but you're basically looking for it to be smooth and flat on the top. Um, the, the side walls are typically rough, but once you mill into them, they're smooth, so that's not a problem. Okay. Um, how can redeposition be avoided, especially in carbon materials? Uh, yeah, I'll go back to um, my slides on redeposition. Just looking for it. Okay, um, so I mentioned some ways to manage it. And so you can use, with any material, really, you can use lower, lower beam current. You can change your milling geometry. And you can also um, change your angle, like over tilting. Um, but it, it really, this depends on the application. So if you're talking about, maybe I'll assume TEM sample prep. Um, you don't want to mill kind of too deeply because um, like deeper than you you actually need to for the to look at for TEM because um, if you're milling way down at the bottom of your your lamella like beyond the edges that you need or beyond the the TEM window size that you need then that those atoms there could end up redepositing on the face uh, also the timing you sort of want to finish your um, your thinning or cleaning of a TEM lamella surface with sort of the beam last hitting the most important parts so that it's the cleanest. Usually you'll see that the darkest part of a TEM lamella surface is usually the cleanest where the beam was just located. Um, and if you're having deposition issues there, well, you don't really, um, if you've cleaned it well, but uh, yeah, so lower beam current helps um, changing your geometry as well. I, I guess this question would, would depend a little more on the exact context of what you're asking, but that, that was sort of a general answer. Okay, serpentine scan should be advantageous over raster scan because of no flyback time. Yes. But what about the multiple changes of direction, 90 degrees? Would that cause a distortion 
um, if a very precise pattern is expected to be male? It's so. not, that's sort of just how I've drawn it. It's not really a 90 degree chain change. It's like, it's one step down. So it's a 180 and a, a shift of one pixel down. Okay, and then they wanted you to comment on how about spiral scans? Um, I wouldn't use a spiral for a rectangle. Um, maybe like for an annular mill pattern, that's that can be basically a spiral. Um, it would be a weird situation to want that for a rectangle, unless if you have a situation where you want the edges, all four edges of a rectangle to be clean, then you could do like a reverse spiral if software will allow, allow you to do that, where the start is the center and the finish is the edges. But uh, I can't think of many applications where you would want a spiral for a rectangle. All right, we'll ask one more question. Um, this one is about cryofib. Um, so this person was recently talking with a researcher about trying cryofib to make TM foils from a fairly unstable metal hydride while not decomposing the hydrides. Does That's that sound yeah. practical? Uh, that is, I assume you're talking about zirconium. Um, and if you're not, it's probably still relevant, but uh, yeah, so, so we do that um, with zirconium, especially the, the nuclear industry wants us to cryothin the zirconium and uh, there's, um, there's papers showing that there's an advantage in doing so. Um, you don't need to do the whole lift out though under cryo or even the beginning of the thinning. It's really just the last few steps where the the cryo temperature is important um, we've we've shown that it's kind of irrelevant to use cryo much before the end so i, I would say do your whole lift out at room temperature because attaching and all that is not very easy to do uh, when the in cryo conditions um, and then you could even do some initial thinning if you want, but like I would say cryo at 500 nanometers thick and lower, probably necessary. But yeah, that's definitely practical and it's something we, we do regularly with zirconium at least.